I wanted to talk today about what is probably the least sexy topic in software development, which is legacy code. Um, when I was 17 and I was considering career choices, uh, I had the opportunity of spending the day with a programmer who was working at a big government agency. And that guy's only job was to make sure that welfare checks would be printed correctly on January 1st, 2000. And he would spend the next three years working in old legacy code to make sure that we would have a riot in Quebec on January 1st, 2000. And that day was as exciting as you can expect it to be. And it's quite a miracle that I still chose to go in computer engineering after that. Uh, but I swore to myself that I would never be doing a job like that. And I chose a career path that would put me as far away from possible from legacy code. Uh, so I did my master's in computer vision, and then I worked in uh, computer-assisted surgery, robot doctors, uh, and I went on to work at Unity, the game engine company. And I'm now a researcher at the National Research Center of Canada, where I study uh, virtual reality and their, the use of game technologies in medical simulation. So you don't get more cutting edge than that. And so that was me. And yet, I didn't uh, manage to escape legacy code. Actually, I worked in a lot of legacy code in my career. Because the truth is, every single line of code turns into legacy at some point. The code you're writing today is already decaying and turning into legacy. And some code decays a lot faster than others. So whenever you work on a prototype and it wasn't meant to be shipped and somebody decides to send it to production, right away you have a lot of legacy code on your hands. Um, when you have a zombie project, a project get, that gets canceled and revived and canceled and revived again, you have a big mess on your hands right away. Uh, when you acquire a startup and you try to integrate that startup's code into yours, to them that wasn't legacy, but to you right away that's legacy code. Because legacy code has nothing to do with how old the language is or the code is. It's about how uncertain that is, how much risk there is uh, when you change something that everything else is going to collapse on your head. And that means that it's everywhere in software. Um, so let's assume that you've just had uh, a project appear on your hands uh, that is a complete mess, and that's now your mess to take care of. Uh, how do you approach it? And as software developers, we all know what's the right thing to do. You know, when you enter a mine that's about to collapse on your head, what you do is you put in a beam so that the roof won't collapse on your head. And that beam is called a unit test or an automated test. Uh, but if I were to tell you, or if, if you were to tell your boss, we're going to stop all development for the next two years because we have 10,000 lines of codes, of testing code to write, and we cannot ship anything, we cannot fix any bug, we cannot do anything until those thousands of lines of testing codes are written, they're going to say you're crazy. A and they're going to be right. You know, We cannot do this in software. If you have software that is being used by actual people, you cannot say we're going to just ignore those users and stop everything because we need to do testing, because we have debt that we need to pay back. Those customers still need fixes, and you still need to do releases because that's what pays your salary. You know, Money keeps to come in. So in the real life, it's impossible to say we're stopping everything and we're just coding tests from scratch, from the ground up, until every single line of code is, is covered. Uh, so what I wanted to propose today is perhaps a more organic way of going about uh, testing in legacy code. Um, it's one recipe. I don't think it's the absolute recipe. I don't believe in absolutes in uh, software processes. Uh, but it's one that was based both on my personal experience at Zimmercast, which was the robot doctor company, and my experience as, at Unity, uh, both of whom are companies where reliability is very important. Uh, in the first case, it's kind of obvious why. Uh, but even Unity, there are 
thousands, if not millions, of games depending on that game engine. So if you have something that is unreliable and you ship a bad version, you're going to have a lot of angry, angry developers on your hand and people who need your game engine to pay their mortgage. Uh, so it's still a very critical project. Um, my talk is also based on uh, a lot of advice I've had from mentors along the way, uh, wise people who've been at it for much longer than I have, and also from uh, experts in the field, people who have written about test-driven development, and agile development, and legacy code, and refactoring. So there's going to be uh, references at the end. So my recipe, the one that I suggest, it's not just mine, uh, boils one down to two simple rules. Test what failed, and that test what's going to fail. Uh, the first is easier to grasp. Uh, basically, take one bug, one bug you've recently fixed, preferably a, an important one, and write a unit test or an automated test for that single test case. And it's not something that requires a big plan or approval for management or anything like that. It's not a big production. You're just doing your job as a software developer and you're making sure that that bug is really fixed properly and that from now on it's not going to fail anymore. And the nice things about bugs is that they're kind of like insects. When you find one in your kitchen, chances are it's not the only one lurking nearby. So if you extend that test just a little bit, maybe make it a little bit more general or think about a few edge cases you might test while you're at it, chances are you're going to find something else nearby. And this is not something that adds a lot of overhead. You know, the first time it might be a little bit longer because if you don't have any test infrastructure at all, you're going to need to set up uh, uh, a testing framework and figure out how things work. Might be there's a little bit of learning involved, but it's not, you know, it's something that can be very well done as skunk work. Like I hope like managers don't listen, but you don't need anybody, anybody's, at the, anybody's uh, permission to do that. You know, you're doing your job. But at the same time, you're planting the seeds of an automated test system that's going to be able to grow from there and to start already paying back dividends. Because chances are you're going to already find bugs with that single test. And if you do this, every time you find a bug, fix a bug, write the test for it, it's going to grow quite quickly with just a little bit of overhead. The other rule is testing the things that you know will fail. And I know that sounds crazy. You know, if you knew where the bugs were, you wouldn't need tests. But think of it like that. What modules are keeping you awake at night? You know, where do you know where the ugly code is lurking? Where are the, the hard problems, the things that you know are going to crash because you don't trust them? And that instinct is very strong. Chances are you know really well where are the, the ugly spots in the code. And that's what it where you want to put your effort first. Um, and that brings me to one possible risk of uh, automated testing, and it's the use of code coverage tools. Uh, code coverage tools are fantastic. It's something that you run alongside your testing code, and it's going to tell you exactly which line of code is hit by your test. So it lets you see, for instance, that in the animation code, there's this big chunk of exception code that nobody ever tested and that might be <coughs> important to test because that's that perhaps that's really critical. Uh, the danger of co code coverage is that it also gives you a metric, something like 75% of animation code is, is covered. And if you start looking at that metric, and especially if you start rewarding people on that metric, metric I can guarantee you that people are going to start testing the low-hanging fruits. They're going to start testing the things that are very easy to test and very unlikely to fail. Things like setters and getters. I mean, I can't imagine a world where a setter or a getter <coughs> might have a bug in it, but chances are that's not where the bugs are lurking. The bugs are in ugly, complex code that 
doesn't necessarily represent a lot of lines, but it's very hard to test. And you don't want to, to write tests just for the sake of writing tests. You want your test suites to fail, and to fail as often as necessary. So you really want to put your effort on the hard stuff, and that doesn't necessarily increase your code coverage number. Um, another thing to be uh, careful about, and it's not necessarily a big no, but it's a tool that can be misused, uh, is what I call uh, the canary testing, um, or more regularly, uh, regression testing. But basically, if you go into a mine, traditionally people would bring a little cannery with them. And if the cannery died, that was a good sign that you needed to get out fast because there were probably dangerous gases around. And you can have the same thing in testing. If you have a big black box algorithm and you have no idea how it works or why it works, but you know it works today, and you just want to make sure that you don't break it by making changes elsewhere in the system, uh, you can feed that algorithm a lot of input, take that output, and then trace a line in the sand. You say, I'm going to write a test that verifies that from now on, every time I feed it that input, I get that exact output back. And if something changes, I'm going to know about it. And that's a very good way of testing complex stuff very quickly. Because at least you can say like that module is not changing. The problem is that the minute you change something in your infrastructure, especially if you fix a bug in a math library, or if you change your compiler, or if you change your graphics card perhaps, and this is graphic code, your test is going to start failing. And it's going to be really hard to know, is it failing for real? Or is it failing because I fixed a bug? And if you have too many of those tests, your test suites are going to start getting red. People are going to start ignoring failing tests because they don't know what to do about them. And the minute you have a bunch of tests that are failing all the time for no good reason, people start distrusting the automated test system. And a it's a slippery, slippery slope because people don't fix things as they fail, and you end up with a totally useless uh, automated test system. So it's a tool that is very useful. And sometimes you have no choice. For instance, in graphics code, chances are it's the only way of testing. Uh, so if you have complex rendering stuff, that's the only way of doing it. But if you're testing an algorithm and you test it through uh, Comparing snapshots of the UI, chances are you are going to have a really brittle test on your hands and you're going to keep updating those snapshots all the time because that's not the right way of testing an algorithm. So try to make sure that you have as little uh, brittle, as little canary tests as you can. Uh, and if you find them, you find tests that keep breaking for no good reason, figure out a way to refactor them so that you don't spend all your testing code just maintaining your test infrastructure. And you can create actually new tests. Um, so if you do this and you test regularly everything that fails and try to invest here and there a bit of time in testing the ugly stuff, your automated test suite is going to start growing and you're going to have a very useful tool on your hands. You know, people are going to start trusting more and more the automated test system, and they will want to invest in it because it's saved their hide a couple of times, and it doesn't take long before developers realize that this tool there is making me save face, uh, or for managers to realize like this tool there is catching bugs before they go in production. And you're going to be able to have uh, people actually uh, invest in that system. Now, uh, the uh, experts of test-driven development and the purists uh, like to say that uh, automated test systems, if they're good enough, uh, make manual testers redundant. And I know some com companies actually do not have a single tester. Facebook, for instance, doesn't have a single manual tester. Uh, you're actually the manual testers. 
Um, but in high reliability industries, I've yet to see um, uh, a company that doesn't actually have manual testers. And there are good reasons for that. Because humans and computers are very complementary. Uh, humans are really bad at routine or at repeating the same thing over and over again. Um, and if that's what your testers are doing, it's a really horrible job to be doing. Uh, but humans are very good at being subjective. Uh, a good experienced tester can tell you things like the, the interface is clunky or it's very easy to make a mistake there. Uh, they can work around holes in your system. If you're developing and things are not finished yet, this is going to confuse a computer. But a, a tester who's working alongside with you can work around the bits of the, the code. You can figure out, yeah, I know that part looks like a bug, but I know it's just not finished. And I'm going to test those bits which are more finished. And if you're having to send a critical bug uh, fix to a customer, I can swear that uh, a manual, good manual tester is going to be able to bring you a lot more confidence in your fix in, say, four hours than whatever code you can yourself code in four hours. And if in the best scenario, you have both. You have the manual tester doing as much as they can in those four hours. And you also have the developer writing targeted automated tests for the little bits that are harder to test by a human. What you don't want to do is have manual testers trying to replace computers. And that's often how manual testers are used. You know, they have a scripted test that they follow over and over again, and they don't deviate from it. And I want to tell you a story about manual testers. Um, at the time, I was working at Zimmercast, which uh, is an orthopedic company that does surgery uh, assistance systems. And we were working on a hip replacement software. And one of the things that that software was doing is giving the surgeon a measure of the leg length before and after surgery. And one of the developers at some point uh, realized that uh, the system, in some weird circumstances, would give out a leg length of six meters. And we went to see uh, the software testers at the time. And they were consultants. We had brought in consultants as testers because we were uh, out of hands at that point. And we asked the guys, you know, have you ever seen this? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we've seen this before. How come nobody told us? Well, it wasn't my job to test the precision. Now, you know, it, they were right. It, it was somebody else's job to test precision. But, you know, a six meter la long leg, you don't need a doctor's degree to figure out it's not the right number. And while it was true there were precision protocols being run later on, chances are those protocols will not have caught that issue because sometimes there's only one chance of catching a bug. And if you miss it, the next person is going to find it as a customer. So I think it's very important, even if you're a, a tester writing, testing scripted tests because regulatory <laughs> rules force you to, or because you have your automated test infrastructure is not good enough yet, or because it's something that's really hard to automate, I think it's important to look beyond just what you're testing and keep a good <coughs> peripheral vision. Because that's another thing where humans are good. You know, humans are good at seeing things at the side of their vision, little flickers, and things that make you think, like, what? What did just happen? Like, I thought I'd saved. How come? How come it's not exactly what I expect? And when you get that feeling, just take the time to dig into it. Even if you're a developer, like often we're working on something and we're deep in our thing. And you see something weird, something crashes, or something is just odd. And it's very tempting to say, like, oh, pff, I don't care. It's not what I'm working on at the, the time. But if 
you do that, chances are it's the only time you had, the only, the only chance you had of catching that bug, and it's not going to come again. <coughs> so I think it's important when you start having people in the team say, that's not my job, you're in trouble in terms of reliability. Because uh, shipping a quality product, it's everybody's job. And it's very tough. Um, and I wanted to touch briefly on uh, how you build a culture where, where people have that idea that quality and reliability is everybody's job. And especially if you're st starting from legacy code, which is a piece of crap, and it's very hard to trust that uh, it's going to keep on being reliable. Um, and to me, it all boils down to a culture of respect. Because if you're working with legacy code, what you're actually doing is you're working in a team with the people who were there before you and the people who are going to be there after you, both of whom are not there to defend themselves. And it's very tempting when you look at code and you see something ugly to say, like, who is the idiot who wrote this? I mean, come on, come on. And that might be uh, satisfying for a few seconds, uh, but it doesn't help anything. And the truth is, most people working in the software are not idiots. Like most people work doing our job are smart people. And there is usually a good reason why things get ugly. Uh, sometimes people take shortcuts because they have to ship a system. And the reason they took that shortcut is the reason you have a job today, because otherwise the company would have closed down. And that's a very good reason to have an ugly act in the code. Sometimes the code is messy because the reality underneath is messy. Like we like, to, as software developers, to think of nice, elegant systems that are really like generalized and nice. But the real life is often messy. And uh, if your code has that history in it, chances are it is able to catch a lot of messiness and a lot of complexity in your problem domain that you would never be able to catch if you were rewriting specs from scratch. And sometimes it's also a case of inexperience. You know, we all learn as developers, and sometimes the first time around, we do kind of bad stuff. And it is very humbling when you realize, actually, that the person you just called an idiot is yourself five years ago. <laughs> so I think it's important to stop that knee-jerk reaction and to actually try to think what was the intent of the person. And it's also a question of respect for the people who are going to follow. Because your code is already turning into legacy code. So if you don't want to be called an idiot, uh, try to leave pebbles behind you. Try to leave traces of why you're doing things. And sometimes it's as simple as having a comment that says, I have no clue what I'm doing. Because if you have no clue, don't hide it. Let the person who follow know why you were doing things. And perhaps they have a clue. Or at least they're gonna, not going to wonder forever why you had that magic number there. You probably had a good reason. And it's also about you know if you spend two hours understanding some bug, put the reference in your code. You know, it's a, it's a story that you leave for the people who are going to follow later on. It doesn't have, you don't have to pretend that you know everything or, or that you figure it out the first time around. If you struggle with something, leave traces about that in your code. That's what comments are, are for. And uh, now I'm going to put on my feminist hat. Uh, I think uh, diversity in very important. And respect for uh, the maintainers of our code is very important. Uh, often, we have this weird situation in software where uh, legacy code is actually our only asset. It's what we invest in as software developers. And it's the only tangible product we have. So that's, you, you spend millions of dollars investing on a big chunk of code. And this maintainers, what they do is they take
take that investment and they make sure it keeps paying dividends that our existing customers are happy and keep buying our product. And yet, we have this culture in our industry where there tends to be this split between the maintainers and the innovators. And you have the cool guys who are good and smart and doing new stuff. And you have those who weren't quite good enough to be innovators, who are pigeonholed in maintenance tasks. So you're actually trusting your biggest asset in the hands of people you don't actually trust, that you think are not smart enough to be doing new stuff, or are too junior to be doing new stuff. But there's this weird dichotomy, this weird uh, situation where we don't actually uh, give legacy code that the respect that it needs. And this is something that Unity does really, really well. Uh, at Unity, there are parallel career tracks for innovation and for QA and sustained engineering. And uh, there are very experienced people in both tracks. And they are uh, on par in terms of salary as well. Uh, I was uh, for a time uh, an SDET at Unity, uh, software development, software developer in test. And that was exactly the same salary as the people actually doing innovation. Because you want those people to be as good as your developers. And you want them to be creative. We need creative people in both types of work. And often, as women, we tend to be pigeonholed in maintenance tasks because we're so thorough and we're so detail-oriented with the, the subtext that we don't mind cleaning up after other people. And that might be true of some women, but that's certainly not true about me. Like I hate cleaning up after my girls, so I'm certainly not going to clean up after grown-up men. <laughs> and that's even more dangerous if your maintenance jobs are undervalued and underpaid. So I think if you look at your company and you find that you have diversity, but that diversity is relegated to more maintenance tasks and that the people in innovation are all young white males, you probably have a serious diversity problem, even though on paper it looks good. So think about it, you know, diversity is important everywhere and we need as many uh, detail-oriented and all retentive people in innovation than we need creative out-of-the-box thinkers and legacy maintenance. It's, we need diverse teams everywhere. So, if you were to take out one thing from this conference, uh, I'm hoping that it's going to be that legacy code is a big investment. It, it's valuable. It's very valuable because, first of all, you, you spent millions of dollars in it. Um, and it contains a lot of wisdom about your problem domain and about your customers and about the struggles of the people who came before you. So. I know it's tough, you know, it's tough and sometimes unpleasant. Uh, and it's easier to just throw everything away and rewrite from scratch code that you know. But if you're doing that, you're throwing a lot of value away. And I think every developer, whether they're in super innovative stuff or if they're working in COBOL on an old banking system, we all need to know how to do this. We all need to write a domain. And we all need to understand why uh, it's important to maintain legacy code. Because if we're not able to <coughs> use that legacy code, use those bases, those foundations, and make them more solid when they have to, we're just going to be doomed to rewrite the same code over and over again. And we're, we're not going to be able to innovate. So innovation requires strong roots, and we need to maintain those able to trust them and build on them. So thank you very much. Um, I want to give you a couple of references. Uh, the first one especially is very interesting. Um, it's uh, a way 
of uh, approaching manual testing uh, in a very creative way that forces you to get out of your rut as a tester. Um, for instance, uh, you, you, you plan to things like, I'm going to use the system, but on a very tiny screen in German. And you find ways of getting out of your usual testing route. So it's very, very useful. It's something that we used a lot of Unity and that uh, was able to catch a lot of issues. Um, X-Unit test pattern, it's more about how, how you get started about unit testing if you've never done it. It's not you no know, rocket science, but it's uh, still useful if you have no idea how to get started. Um, working eff effectively with legacy code uh, gets more into the uh, nitty gritty stuff of how you actually work with legacy code and test it if it's kind of nasty. And um, Unity made a very detailed uh, blog series about their QA process. Uh, it might not be the best QA process ever, but I think it's a fairly good one. Uh, and uh, they've taught a lot and iterated a lot about it. So it's very uh, interesting. Thank you.